without further ado, introduce our speaker. Ian will talk on the impact of extensive groundwater contamination at coal ash sites and subsequent pollution of waterways and bioaccumulation. Ian is an expert in water quality and water management, environmental planning and environmental regulation. He's been called a water nerd. Uh, you may have seen him in the news recently. His research interests include freshwater ecology, water chemistry and water pollution. Ian has a long-standing interest in the impact of urban development and mining on streams and rivers and is an enthusiastic participant in community engagement activities in water science and management projects. So uh, with that introduction, I'll just hand straight over to Ian to uh, give us his presentation. Over to you, Ian. Thanks very much for that, Adrian, and, and welcome everyone. And um, thanks for taking the time to listen in. Um, my own family are watching TV and they're not showing the slightest bit interested in what I'm talking about. They don't even ask. They're just watching some program I hate. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I have written this talk and rewritten it and changed it. Um, and I stopped working on it about five minutes ago. This is a very dynamic area. Um, and can I tell you, this makes me, working on this makes me very, very wealthy. Um, not measured in dollars, but in terms of life experience. It's been a, a, an amazing road working on coal and particularly looking at coal and waterways, um, definitely a journey. So I'll start with this map of the Sydney Basin. And the, these aren't the only coal mines in the Sydney Basin, but these are the ones that I've worked on and collected data. So each one of these, and there's eight of them, I've visited a minimum of six times. And that's one of the problems with doing this work there. A lot of these locations are remote remote and also really quite difficult to get to, and sometimes kind of impossible to get to legally. So it's really nice knowing some friends that can give you legal representation at times. Um, haven't been caught or charged, but yes, it's a, it's a constant problem. I have more minds and problems than I can possibly work on with my lifetime and the lifetime of students, friends and colleagues. But a lot of my talk, I'll talk about these. Now I've color coded them. Red for closed, like the Canyon coal mine. Believe it or not, it's not officially closed. Uh, that's a long and complicated legal process. Uh, 23 years and going. Uh, Berrimah, it's mothballed or care and maintenance heading towards closure. Green is active. Um, Angus Place is officially mothballed. Basically, that means we want the price of coal to go up so we can start ripping the stuff out. But it is ready to be mined at Angus Place. So the ventilation is on and they pump the water out of the mine. But for me, it started with this the Kenyan colliery. And that is a picture of the Gross River. The Gross River is a beautiful river that runs from somewhere very, very close to Mount Victoria and loops around and forms giant gorges and chasms. Blue Gum Forest is a very beautiful location that probably quite a few of you have been to. It winds around and the Gross River then joins the, literally the meeting place of the Hawkesbury and Nepean. It hits at Yarramundi and downstream, it's tidal and it's the Hawkesbury, upstream, it's flowing and that's the Nepean. And I first came across some kind of an idea that there was pollution in the Gross River when I was working as a junior scientist at Sydney Water in about 1992. And we had actually been dropped off and walked down to Blue Gum Forest. And with my colleagues, we were taking samples of the Gross River, working our way up from Blue Gum Forest, Govitz Creek, the problem we were working on at the time was sewerage and the impact of poorly treated sewerage on surface waterways of the Blue Mountains. And we got upstream, up above where the impacts from Blackheath sewage treatment plant came into the Gross River. And this is otherwise a very close to pristine waterway. And 
the aquatic life in the river and I was studying the invertebrates living in the stream, they just disappeared. We, we were sampling and our net just had no life in it. And that was 1992. It took me years and years and years and years to finally get to this point, which was about 2002. And that's where this, you know, highlighter pen, this sort of orange ferric ochre like colour came in to the Grace River. And I had been working down, this is a really hard place to get to. There's no tracks in this part of the Grace River. And that's where I saw the long-term impacts of mining. Uh, it's Canyon Colliery closed in Anzac Day, 1997. It still pollutes today and it will pollute for centuries. And how much money has been spent on rehabilitation of that pollution? Nothing, absolutely nothing. 1997, they walked away and this was a very big underground coal mine, so big that there was a rail loop built and it was largely um, fed by sending coal over to Taiwan. So this is what did it for me. I will be going back there in a few weeks with my current master's student. And that's what the drainage addit, there's two drainage addits coming out of this mine. Although it's shut, it still pollutes. And the drainage that comes out is full of this um, large chunk of the periodic table. The ochre colour gives a clue, lots of iron, there's aluminium manganese, barium strontium, but there's zinc and nickel, and uh, concentrations way, way, way above um, that that's tolerable for aquatic life. And although the mine's shut, it seems bizarre. It's like you turn off your car, 23 years later, it's still smoking away in the garage. It's because the mine has flooded, it mobilises sulphur in the coal, and that leaches, that's like this you know, chemical um, acid bath that extracts a lot of the metals out of the local geology. So that sort of got me going. That mine is this unshaded part in the top of the Gross River, not far off Bell. But what I'm gonna talk about now is an active mine that's occupying and has occupied a lot of my attention for the last eight years, and that's Clarence Colliery. It's an underground coal mine to the north of the Canyon coal mine that closed. It started production in around 1982. It's undermines, it's an underground coal mine that mines under State Forest, Noon State Forest, not far from Zigzag Railway. And this is really for me, a big part of the problem. This is where the mine waste is discharged to the environment and to the coal mine, a river is a self flushing waste disposal system. So this is where roughly half a megalitre a day of accumulated mine drainage from the bottom of the Clarence coal mine. It's pumped to the surface. They use some of this water. It's a coal washery as well. So they clean the coal, that is get rid of the, you know, non-coal fragments of, you know, sand and rock fragments, etc. And they use a bit of the water on site for dust suppression and then they dispose of it. And that's what I study. So I'm gonna do a bit of a photo montage. I've never done this before, but there's the mine drainage. This is called by the EPA, they call this the license discharge point. And it discharges into a small tributary which goes into the Wollongambia River, a very, very famous river. Let me build this photo montage. Here I have Eddie, a um, undergrad student a few years ago, and that's in the Wollongambia River, just downstream of the mine and just upstream where the Wollongambia River enters the national park. There is the surface workings of the mine. And here is upstream. Here is my master's student Callum climbing a pagoda and all the ground under where he's standing is undermined. There's some mine workings in the past. Even at this point, this is pagoda country. Beautiful, intricate sandstone formations and the river goes in and out of these very, very narrow canyons, sometimes called slot canyons. So they're very, very narrow and very tall. And this photo 
These top two photos were taken about uh, 10 days ago. And that is upstream. That Again, that photo is the Wollongambi River taken about 10 day, days ago. And I sometimes think the term river is perhaps a bit generous. It's at that point really the Wollongambi trickle. It flows probably with impressive volume after very, very heavy rain, but most of the time really is just seeping. And then this photo in the center, that is ever present every day, it's discharging its waste. And downstream where Eddie's sticking his conductivity probe into the river, at that point, the mine drainage makes up about 90 to 95% of the flow. Now downstream, I don't know how many people have been to the Wollongambi, that's me jumping in the river with my net looking at invertebrates. This is now deep in the Blue Mountains National Park, which is also, this is one of the most protected and valued environments in the world because it's national park. It's part of the Colo Wild River. This is all part of the Colo catchment. It's a declared wilderness area. And of course, number four, it's part of the Blue Mountains, Greater Blue Mountains World Heritage Area, 20th anniversary this Sunday, by the way. So this is 20 kilometers downstream and about 22 k's downstream, it looks like that. And one of my former master students took that photo, a waterproof camera, as he went canyoning. The Wollongambi is one of the most popular wild rivers to visit in southeastern Australia. Uh, people go bushwalking, put wetsuits on, pump up uh, inflatable air mattresses and then float down the gorge. Little do they know that is probably about 30% mine drainage. So that's the Wollongambi River and the Clarence Coal Mine. I've rebuilt my talk because I've got late mail on this. We're studying it at the moment um, and I'll explain why. But firstly, my trade, I study the life of rivers. So I largely look at the invertebrate life. Uh, I call this my Brady Bunch photo. If you can imagine Alice in the middle, the parents at the top, of, perhaps that's, I can't remember, I think that's Marsha. Marsha is a predatory water beetle. Marsha has four eyes, the predatory water beetle. It's called uh, the whirligig beetle, zoological name, uh, gyrinidae. I love that name. It gyrates all over the place. They run around on the surface of creeks and they literally have four eyes or their eyes are divided into two halves, one half looking up, one half looking down. And it's an attack predator. So it'll look for something like this beautiful, tasty stonefly beside it and then they swim, look at these arms. Look at those two arms. That's the, you know, that, that's the Ian Thorpe of beetles. Six legs, it's an insect, but they've modified two swimming arms, so it is really, really fast. So, you know, this is the kaleidoscope of life I expect to see in a mountain stream and something like mine drainage, and this is how I got into this game, knocks this for six and completely changes the community because it can be so, ecologically destructive. So that is literally what I do. I, you know, I've, I had years, I'm the youngest of five kids. So for years and years and years, my siblings, they weren't particularly kind people, would frequently say, and just go jump in the creek. So like I, you know, took that literally and I do, and I get paid for it. So tucked into you. Um, that is the Wollongambi River. I've put my net down the bottom and I've taken a you know, replicate sample of aquatic life by stirring up those rocks. There's Nakia Belma, PhD student, working hard, sitting down, watching me. To be honest, it normally is the opposite. I normally watch him. He does all the work. But there's a camera, so I jumped into it. And in the Wollongambi River, I looked at two aspects in particular. One aspect is what is the diversity of invertebrate life? So we looked at each of the different families of invertebrates. Mind you, some of these families may represent 10, 20, 30 species. So just a way of enumerating the biodiversity. W1, blue, that's upstream. That represents the background or the reference. W2, three and four are progressively from about 50 meters down to 21 kilometers downstream. And this shows that the biodiversity of the river is heavily impaired by the mine drainage. And to be honest, comparing to the literature, this is a big impact. We picked 20 kilometres downstream as we should see a good recovery by then. So that's the richness. 
at the abundance of invertebrates. Now remember, these aquatic invertebrates, they're the life for a lot of water birds like kingfishers, a lot of water lizards, water dragons, fish, other invertebrates, you know, a whole lot of life, platypus if they're around. Look at the numbers. The abundance we get in the background, upstream and, and other reference sites, about 100 invertebrates. We sample for 30 seconds over a small 30 centimetre by 30 centimetre square, even 20 kilometres downstream. It's reduced by um, about 90%. So ecologically, a huge negative impact from that mine. Why? This is where we take samples and get help from the chemists. Two pollutants here, nickel and zinc, a bit like the Canyon coal mine, my first example. Upstream, zinc, we can detect it at you know just above detection limits. The dotted line is the ecologically safe level. That's you know the ANZEC guideline for zinc. Now this is downstream of the coal mine. It is you know roughly 12 times above the concentration um, or 100 milligrams above the safe concentration. This is data we collected. Nakia, PhD student now, we collected this 2012-2013. We've just got some results um, on an update I'm keen to share with you. But how, how and why is this important? Because we use information on water chemistry to help drive the regulation of the mine. By New South Wales EPA, I've got sulphur crested cockatoos screeching their head off. I hope they're not bothering you. Um, it's that time of the night. But they use, the EPA uses something they call an environment protection license. And for this mine, for the Clarence Colliery, clicking onto the next one, it's about a 25 page document. They allowed the mine to release zinc at the concentration of 2.5 milligrams per litre. Now, for me, this is just amazing. It's called an Environment Protection Licence. It's under the protection of the Environment, Environment Operations Act by the EPA. You know, are you getting some themes here that this is good for protecting? 2.5 milligrams per litre, that is, in terms of micrograms, 2,500. I'll go back. It's a really important point. Micrograms, you would not even get two and a half thousand on this scale. I only go up to 150. Their license, if they, if the mine actually produced the amount of zinc they allowed, this would kill the Wollongambi River all the way down to the Colo and probably down to the Hawkesbury. Can someone please tell me how this protects the Wollongambi environment? And this is the EPA. This is the problem to me. How have the regulators allowed this to happen? Okay, we did something about it. I'm exhausted because this is a really, really slow process. So we collected data. Oh yeah, sponsor for tonight is George Orwell. That's the only way I can understand the EPA. Remember, I hope all of you have read George Orwell. If not, read 1984. Um, Double speak, the Ministry of Love. Um, it has the opposite effect of what they say. I'm not knocking the EPA. I like them, but give them some resources and let them do their job and keep pol politics out of it. We got the EPA to vary their licence. This took so much work. I collected data with my PhD and undergraduate colleagues. I'll go to the next. They changed the license through this, but I'll explain the process. We did our study 2012, 2013. At the time, and this is the collieries data, the zinc content in the water ranged between close to 400 and 200 micrograms per litre. It's dangerous at 10 and it makes up about 90% of the river. So we did our study. We then analysed and wrote up a paper went to a conference, we shared it with the Blue Mountains community, the Blue Mountains Conservation Society, I love them. They then, we all shared it with the EPA and convinced the EPA to review the Environment Protection Licence. Don't hold your breath, this can take years. They created a couple of committees, they got their scientists from Office of Environment Heritage to do a study, 
the coal mine got their consultants. It was an incredible jamboree of people and chewing up time. But then in 2017, we got a new license that actually has ecologically relevant pollutant discharge limits that help protect the environment. I've redone my whole talk tonight because we've got good news on this. So in 2012, 2013, these are the concentrations of zinc. These are two reference sites. The level that the mine was producing at that time was about 200 micrograms. So it's not even on the scale. It literally is off the scale. And we got levels of 130, just under 50 and 20 kilometers downstream, just over 40. Well, I went there two weeks ago. That's why I've redone the talk and look at my latest numbers. So in yellow, we got this two weeks ago, November, 2020. The new license now requires the mine to discharge zinc levels of under 10. I'm so happy. It took a long time. We've been watching the colliery data. It, they're saying that they produce it at this level. We went out and tested it and I think they're right. But check this out. Look downstream. This is one kilometre downstream. They are producing zinc at that level, but we believe that there's so much contamination built up in the sediment. As the Wollongambi flows, it's stirring up and mobilising um, historic levels of zinc and other pollutants. Anyway, I won't go too far, but it's just so rare for me to get good news about water pollution from a coal mine. We had we got the Blue Mountains community behind us. The EPA listened eventually. Um, we even dragged them out there uh, because we had a meeting in head office. And Nakari and I said, have you been there? And the bosses hadn't. Um, so very proud of this. And we're now looking to see if the invertebrates are coming back to life in the river. But look, I'll keep going. The big problem that bothers me is we are clearly at the end of coal mining, whether that's 20 years away, 30 years away, 15, five years away. I don't know. Don't think anyone knows. But clearly, we're towards the end of coal. And what bothers me is what is going to happen when the coal mines close? We have an example. This is looking down the inclined railway, and that is about 20 degrees going down. It's not quite like Scenic Railway at uh, Katoomba, but it's not far off it. So the workforce and machinery went down and climbed railway here, and this was a conveyor belt bringing coal out. This was the Medway or the Berrima Colliery, and it stopped operation in 2013, after more than a century, I think 1860s. I was alerted about this. I've got quite a big network and I heard from the community and I also heard from the EPA that told me there were some issues when they, when they stopped this mine. So they flooded about 15% of the underground workings at this mine. And this was Australia's longest continuously operating underground coal mine. It was also very small. It was a boutique mine. It mined coal which Boral owned eventually, and they sent the coal to the Berrima Cement Works, which help cook up the limestone and make cement. So when it shut, they switched a lot of pumps and ventilation off, and they allowed quite a few areas underground to flood. I have had it estimated that it was about 15% of the underground workings. And the drainage was producing about two and a half megalitres a day which is almost exactly an Olympic swimming pool. It came out and this actually went into the Winter Caribbean River, which most of us who drink Sydney water, we drink part of this because this is about number four river in terms of volume going into Warragamba Dam. So it came out with a very high dissolved level of metals. And as it hit the open air, a lot of those metals would oxidize and then flock and drop to the bottom. And you can see this build up of ochre. Again, it's, it's telltale. They call it in the United States, yellow boy, um, because they're all colorblind. It's actually orange, but perhaps that's our iron. Um, but in amongst that are 
almost always some toxic constituents. And that went into the Windsor Caribbean River. Again, number four river going into Warragamba Dam. Uh, how could this possibly go wrong? I heard about it and Boral, frankly, were really good to me. Better to me than I deserved in many ways because when I started looking at this, we started looking at this in 2016, I'd heard about it for quite a long time. Boral actually gave me all their data. They're the only miner to have ever done this. So this is the pH level and the mine 2008, 2013 produced mine drainage that was slightly alkaline. Um, and that's quite a good thing uh, in terms of dissolving metals. But then when it closed, they then flooded 15% of the mine. And after it flooded, pH started stepping down. And it went down from June 2016 all the way down to February 2017. And what was happening was that as they flooded, it was dissolving sulphur. Sulphur is associated with all coal around the world. And as it dissolved, it made a mild sulfuric acid. These levels aren't that low. It was dropping below seven, so it's acidic, but not heavily acidic. So you would call this mild acid mine drainage. In parts of the world, this can get down to pHs of two and three. Really, really strong acid. Australia has tends to have low sulfur coal. It's one of the reasons why our stuff sells for a little bit more in the market. But what did that do? This is, um, I've seen no other example in the world that's been able to document this. The nickel level, along with zinc, nickel's one of those nasties. They're like a gang of two, zinc and nickel, um, the you know, ecological nasty brothers. It was about 150 micrograms per litre in the drainage of the mine when it was operating. They flooded the mine. Of course, as they flooded it, when I say flooded it, they didn't turn on taps or anything. They just switched off pumps. And because it's a massive, massive area, probably uh, thousands of hectares with galleries, roadways, all these open spaces, these voids underground, the drainage was drip, 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 and over this big area, you know, two and a half megalitres of day would build up. And that diluted the nickel until June 2016, and then it shot up like a firecracker, um, like a skyrocket. And it shot up to over 400 micrograms. No one had ever documented this. We collected in red, that was a lot of um, the data that we collected. Uh, this is the Windsor Caribbean River above the mine. This photo wasn't taken by me. I'm really proud. This photo was actually taken by the resource regulator. I went out with a party, including the resource regulator, the EPA, Boral. Um, I think we had three people from the EPA. Um, I've never managed to get three out before. I, I felt I'd won some kind of a prize just doing that. Um, and a couple of us from uni. That was the river upstream. I'm not joking. These aren't my photos. And this is within half a kilometre downstream. See if you can spot a difference. <laughs> that is the Windsor Caribbean River, September 2017. And that photo, again, it wasn't taken by me. It was taken by New South Wales government, um, mine resource regulator. That photo went everywhere and that created action. That was due to the mine drainage. And there was so much pollution coming out, mobilised metals, it discoloured the river, and in 2017, it was getting very, very, very dry. So it just sort of exacerbated and created quite a visual contamination. Um, it, it's a little bit hard to see the scale. These big squares are five kilometres. Um, so it's a bit of a crappy map. This is the pit top area, and the blue line is the Windsor Caribbean River. I'll just take my cursor around. This is the mined area. And shaded in blue and purple is the area that's flooded. So what happened? Um, Boral have produced a website and explaining this. This is the only time, I'm, I'm really, to be honest, I've had quite a good reaction from Boral. They were very unhappy with me for quite a while, particularly when I invited ABC to come along and film it and share it in media. But Boral went back into the mine 
It's the first time in Australia I've heard of an underground coal mine when they've gone back into to address the pollution. They've installed a treatment for a while and then they call, install these giant concrete bulkheads. They're a concrete company, so I guess they get a pretty good price, but they're trying to seal up the drainage inside the mine. To my knowledge, first time an underground coal mine has actually received action after it's shut to address pollution. Um, I'm gonna to change to another topic. I'm looking at time. Um, Adrian Kim shouted me if I'm going over time. Um, subsidence. Subsidence. Doing well so far. Okay, cheers. Don't be polite. Um, I, I, I don't want you to lose all your, all, all, all your lovely members, so subsidence. I've done a bit of work on this. This causes me huge concern, particularly with water catchments and um, mines under the Warrenora, Avon, Cataract, Cordo and Nepean. But I can't study them because I'll get a fine for going in there. So I do study, this is Red Bank Creek at Picton. And this is a creek that is probably 50% natural, 50% disturbed urban development and a bit of rural. This drains from Thirlmere down towards the Nepean River, um, goes to Stone Quarry Creek and then into the Nepean near Picton. And I've been watching this for years and progressively watching pass after pass of Longwell, Longwell go under the mine. The fracturing, I can only say, is like giant bombs have gone off under the channel. And this is actually due to upsidence. So the channel has actually increased in height relative to the area around it. Um, this is my master student, Callum. He hadn't been there before. And I've taken quite a few people and they go very quiet and they just walk around in amazement. And I don't know if you can see it, there's actually a hose here. And they had actually been trying to glue this together. As if, do you think they will ever be able to fix this up? Um, and downstream, that's the shattered part. There's many sections of shattered channel. Then you get sections like this. Where the shattering has actually enabled groundwater to come up through the cracks. And when it does that, it sets up another geochemical uh, bomb that extracts metals and uh, it's ruined that creek. It'll be interesting to see if they can fix it up. But I've published a couple of papers on it. We've found ecologically that these sections lose just about all the nice, clean, typical invertebrates that we would expect. And there was only one type of invertebrate that did well in this and have a guess which that was, it was the mosquito. And that was partly because the, there was basically a lot of chemical oxygen demand going on in this process. And the dissolved oxygen level was um, almost, almost at the point of detection. So invertebrates couldn't live. Mosquito larvae and pupae have a comparative advantage in that they, they're aquatic invertebrates, but they actually breathe atmospheric air. So they've got siphons, they can tolerate it. So anyway, I'll keep watching this. And this is one of the points. Um, former student Ingrid at that point, that, that's actually a fracture. And it's like um, if, if you've been in a jet spa, this is like a jet spa, but it's not the sort that you'd want to put in. Um, this is actually upwelling and it's actually a reasonable force. Full of dissolved metals, almost no oxygen. We've actually you know, poked a hole in the scum on the surface and it's like a really rich um, RSL carpet on the top because it's bubbling and festering on the surface, oxidizing metals, which then drop to the bottom. Um, it's absolutely uh, bizarre. And that's because it's cracked the aquifer and groundwater is actually coming up. Uh, so, my last part of the talk tonight is I'm going to talk about concrete. I study urban water and I look at concrete and my worlds have joined. Coal mining has joined with urban water and I'll explain why. There's a growing market for recycled concrete aggregate and I'm going to explain what this is. Um, master's student Katie Purdy did this work. Um, 
Uh, she was quite brilliant. Um, actually, she kind of intimidates me. She's so good. I'm supposed to teach her. None of that went on. She was brilliant. One of the experiments we did was we looked at the geochemical effect of water and concrete. Concrete is very reactive. The calcium carbonate breaks down with water readily. Not, you know, it's the, the Gladesville Bridge isn't going to break down tomorrow, but slowly underwater, little bit by little bit, the calcium and the carbonate split and potassium comes out and silica comes out. But when you break up the concrete and you put water through it, the reaction is amazing. So this is an experiment. We've recirculated water through a plastic pipe. That's the orange diamonds on the bottom. Concrete pipe, that's the blue circle. And we put it down a gutter with these concrete aggregates. pH shot up like a skyrocket and it peaked at over nine with small aggregates. And this is the link to coal mining. Can you work out what that link might be? We also looked at the concentration of metals in the water before, uh, very, very low levels. And to be honest, we took out iron, iron is a big constituent, but we were looking at non-iron metals. And look to the right, recycled concrete aggregate. After recirculating the water through that for a hundred minutes, we got all of you know, this kaleidoscope of the periodic table and we got barium and strontium. These are the two biggest metals we see coming out and associated with coal. Where's that from? It's from this, fly ash. In Australia, we use fly ash. This is actually um, the old Wang power station, a very poor performer and no coal-fired power stations in Australia would produce a plume of fly ash like this now because it's so nasty for air quality. They catch it. We produce in New South Wales alone about 2,000 tonnes a day of this. They dump it, often in a slurry, but they catch some of it, dry it, and they sell it to the concrete industry. We've got growing accumulations of coal ash up in Lake Macquarie, Lower Hunter Valley, uh, Lithgow, and a couple of other locations, but they mix it and use it as a setting agent in concrete. And when you pass water through it, particularly if it's broken up into small fragments, you can start to release some of these coal metals. Um, so that is my sl last slide, and I'm happy to take questions. Um, I can only think of different points I've missed. So, yep, away to you. Any, any questions there, Kim or Adrian or anyone else? The, um, your relationship with the EPA springs to mind as a, as a question, and uh, it must be a bit of a roller coaster ride um, with them looking over your shoulder. Look, abs absolutely. And I, I do feel uh, some of the professionals that I admire most in this world actually work at the EPA. And I feel bad when I'm critical. I do. I spoke to one the other day and I said, I feel like we work for the same team. You know, we want the best thing for the environment. We just got different sponsors. At the uni, I'm given an enormous amount of freedom to do research and sort of, I suppose, influence change. But we just got different sponsors. And the trouble with the EPA is that partisan bozos from either side of politics come in and change things around. So, yeah, it is. Look, it can be awkward. And I often do embarrass them and say awful things. But it's just so frustrating. I want to see them use good science to manage our precious resources. <laughs> mm, good point. Um, I'm not sure. Oh, here's one. Um, Kim? Deb? Yes. Uh, yes, go ahead, Deb. Uh, Ian, Debbie, Andrew. Yeah, very interesting talking. Uh, so what do you expect is going to happen to our metropolitan water catchments with the continued expansion and coal mining and the historic coal mining there? The water quality coming out of those catchments, is that being kept secret? Do you think there are, you know, dangerous levels of 
of these pollutants entering the water, the drinking water system there? Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. Thanks, Debbie. I was just looking around on my desk, um, which looks like some um, bunch of robbers has come in and turned everything up, but I can't find it. I usually have something. There was a submission that Water New South Wales made to the, uh, the, the mining, the expert panel for mining in the catchment. Mm. That contained the proof I wanted. They had manganese, I think it was manganese and aluminium levels, I think in Cordo and mm. Barak Reservoir. Yes, they are. They are mobilising pollutants. A lot of those pollutants are building up in the water. And then mm. levels got really low last year. About a year ago, um, I, I helped ABC uh, analyse some of the data. They did a freedom of information under the, you know, the GIPA. Mm. And it is clearly getting worse. Mm. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's... It, it, it's an incredible situation. You can't walk in these catchments. You can't litter. No. no. But, but coal mines can do what we know is 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 at the cost of the future sustainable production of water. It's mm. it's madness. I it's, think we're lucky to still have good quality water, and we're also lucky that they can probably filter a lot of this out. But it's not good for the sustainable um, you know future supply of water. And no. I, it, it drives, it drives me, uh, it drives me insane that situation. And you look, look, thanks. I, I, I don't, I don't have um, a great deal of optimism. And do you think the EPA has been told to keep quiet about that? Well, the EPA don't have much of a role. It's actually more the planning minister. Once the planning minister gives approval for a mm. month, the EPA really look at the noise impacts, the water pollution of the waste, and but not the mining on the surface. Mm. They've got a very small role. I reckon the priority comes from Premier and Cabinet, and mm. you know, it's jobs and investment and royalties, and then basically that's enabled by planning. Mm. Um, EPA about five steps or more down. National parks are even further down than that. Yes, yes. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks, Ian. Here's another one along similar lines. Um, Hi Ian, how much do you think our governments underestimate this problem and more importantly, what it could mean in a future where water is becoming increasingly scarce? That's from uh, uh, Bella Peacock. Thanks for that, Bella. Great question. Great question. Um, I reckon this time last year, Bella, I reckon governments really appreciated the value of water right around Australia, but particularly New South Wales, particularly inland. I thought this time last year, I... I wasn't sure what we were going to do. The levels were going down so fast. Sydney has a profligate consumption of water and the desalination plant can only produce about 15% of our supply. I didn't know what we were gonna do. So I saw lots of government interest, a lot of media. Then the dams filled. I think governments now go to sleep because it's not a problem for at least one term of government. And what could it mean in a future where water is becoming increasingly scarce? Bella, I look over at Perth, it had a fall. Southwestern Australia has had a drop in rainfall over 50 years of only about 10, 15%, yet stream flow has dropped by 90%. Things, Australia really is the nation for water to either evaporate or soak into the ground. The amount we've got on the surface, it's a fine balance, but because we're warming up and drying out, it's scary. I think the future's scary. And I think we need to uh, um, explore recycling to a much higher degree. And how we can do this to our most valuable near pristine catchments is unbelievable. But I don't know if I answer your question, Bella, but I really, I, 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 I like the implication of it. Okay. Um, I've got a question here for uh, Ian. Yep, Hi, my name's Brett Stevenson. I actually used to work for the EPA many, many moons ago. In fact, right about the time that they started introducing the ANZAC water quality guidelines. Yep. And the levels that you've been referencing this, uh, this evening. Uh, I mean, I, I can tell you there's, there'd be a lot of people within the EPA who would be very, very happy with what you're doing because you're, you're sure telling the staff that they can't, basically, because of all these okay. restrictions and that. So I think that's, you know, I think what you're doing is excellent. I think that a lot of the EPA staff would actually be um, quite, you know, on side 
assess that what their political masters and mistresses and tell them to do. Um, I really I appreciate guess, you making that comment, Brett. Sorry? I, mean, I really appreciate you making that comment. Okay. Um, I, but I guess the thing is, just looking at this, has there been any action or have they actually used any of the money that is in all the, um, the bond, like, you know, the sort of the, um, from the bonds that they are supposed to put in um, for mining, you know, to actually start to do this or to actually structure some sort of program? Because obviously this is going to be a huge issue in the future. Uh, what are we going to do? You know, what's going to happen to all these mines? And not everyone's going to be like Bore and actually, you know, try and do the right thing. Yep. How are we going to, particularly when we sort of sell off half of our mines to, you know, $2 Indian shelf companies and stuff and that, you know, what's going to happen when these mines close? Um, um, this is a really, you know, insignificant um, issue that really needs you know, a coordinated institutional response across all governments, or well, certainly I mean, New South Wales. I, I, I really appreciate the question. And firstly, thanks for the comment about the EPA. I do mm -hmm. feel like their family. They're really good people. Um, uh, my, my opinion changes a bit as you go up the tree, but I think that's the same in most organisations. I think you. I think that's a very pertinent observation. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank, thank you. Um, what you, what you've just, um, what you've just said, Brett, is exactly my concern. And I know this is the Oatley Group. I don't know the Illawarra as well as I should. It's only hit me in the last. Uh, 12 to 18 months that the Illawarra, and I particularly mean the Wollongong um, and Illawarra escarpment, what is going to happen when the Helensburg, the Russell Vale, the Dendrobium and the other mines shut? What's going to happen, I think, is going to be a lot like Berrimah. They're going to flood. It's a wet catchment and you dig a hole in the ground, drainage will come in, they'll switch the pumps off. And where's that going to head? that's going to head towards Wollongong and Port Kembla and um, all the different waterways along. I looked at a map the other day, the Helensburg, the Helensburg mine. That goes into the Hacking River in Royal National Park. Um, you can't stop that. In fact, what I think, what Berrima are doing, what Boral are doing, I'm not 100% convinced will work because coal and, you know, coal and shale, these are really... Um, it's you know, weak sedimentary layers in comparison to sandstone and the United Kingdom had most of their mines shut over a 50 year period and sometimes that pressure builds up. Remember one kilo of water is one kilogram. Berrima mine, 2.5 megalitres a day, um, that's 2.5 million kilograms of water. Um, in the UK they've had that blow still out. Um, so yeah, I'm terrified and I, I, it's a really good point. I don't know how we're going to handle that and I don't see security bonds that will address how we're going to look after that in a sustainable way. Because coal mines, when they're shut, it's a gift that's just going to keep on giving. Mm. And just okay, a um, separate question. Have you done any research on the implications of, uh, of what you're finding uh, in a landscape where um, fracking, gas fracking has occurred? What are the potential interactions between water quality and, you know, stream flow and the impacts of post-gas fracking? Great question. Great question, Brett. Uh, very briefly, I haven't done it directly, but I had some involvement with a PhD student at Macquarie and he looked at um, some of the gas fracking around Camden. Um, you know, the Camden gas fracking, a lot of people might not realise it happens. It's actually an incredibly dry process. Um, the coal mine impacts were much, much larger than the fracking there. However, if we did that in northern New South Wales or southern Queensland, I have no doubt we'd see something completely different. And I think you bring a really good point. And the problem we get with salts and metals, and in fact, I hate it when they call it, they, they call it brine, they bring to the surface. Yes, it's salty, but look at the metals. It's absolutely loaded with metals. If it was just salt, they could use it. It's not. It's got all these nasties in it. Um, but yeah, good question. No, I haven't done much work on that, but I, I expect I will in the future. On that note, um, Ian, there's a question from Kerry Adra. It appears that particularly with one of the rivers, the discharge of the chemicals into the dam could be harmful to health as well as to the environment. Is this taken into account? Yeah, great, great question, Kerry. Um, from what I've seen, not too many of the chemicals have directly been dangerous to human health. Um, 
that's not always the case. I didn't have time to put this in, but something I, I was involved in quite recently has really shaken me up. One of the mines I had studied was one of the Appen mines that discharge waste into the Georges River. That uh, they now have, they're constructing a reverse osmosis plant and the condensed mine waste from that is actually dumped into Allen's Creek, just upstream of Port Kembla Estuary. And I think the concentrations there um, are potentially of concern to human health. Um, and I, I actually just can't believe they're doing it. It's not the mine waste, it's condensed mine waste. Um, do they take it into account? Um, I reckon, I, I don't think there's been much work to explore that question, but I think, uh, I think, I, I think the answer will be no. But thank you, Kerry. Uh, another one from Jim V, um, Jim Vickery, I think. Uh, what do you see as the long-term consequences of the relatively recent use of fly ash in concrete? That's that's what I'm exploring. Um, I think it's I think it's got limitations and hazards. I'll give you an example. I'm I'm doing quite a bit of work at the moment on upland swamps in the Blue Mountains. So they've got very very high conservation value, and two thirds of the swamps are in national parks. So that's great. One third are in the Blue Mountains urban area, and when there's concrete in it. We see those two, barium and strontium, turning up all over the place. And I'd say all over Sydney, we will see barium and strontium. And I think that's through fly ash. Fly ash, it's good that they're using a waste product, but I think that it potentially has many polluting side effects. They're probably at a very low, potentially innocuous level. But when we see the use of recycled concrete aggregates so you've got this enormous surface area and a lot of that's used as a gravel substitute i think that can be environmentally dangerous and a lot of this is used to backfill trenches where they put you know um, telecommunications sewerage and water services trenches you dig a trench in sydney fills with water so yes i'm concerned about the effects and i'll be doing more more work on fly ash how we do it in a sustainable way um, Often you solve one problem and create about eight new ones, and that could be one of them. Mm. Um, and uh, from Sharon Cullis, could you talk a, bit, a little bit about the uh, Environment Protection Licence for the Upper Georges that's taken from 2012 to 2020 to establish? Um, do you have any comments on that one? Yeah, I sure do, and, 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 uh, and thanks for the question. Good, 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 good to hear from you. So I've been on a you know, community reference group with Sharon and uh, that's one of the mines I was just talking about where they're taking the, um, the, the condensed mine waste and then dumping it in the Port Kembla estuary. Um, uh, so perhaps it's good for the Georges and Nepean River, not so good for uh, Illawarra and Port Kembla. Um, the EPL for the Georges, I thought at the time was good but it's been a massive disappointment. And I think South 32 have done everything to frustrate and um, over promise and under deliver. And I've absolutely had it. I think Sharon has as well, but the EPL license that we got the Bathurst office of EPA to do for the clearance is so much better because they actually are implementing the ANZAC guidelines, but they also include monitoring of um, key metals actually in the river as well. So it's not just what's coming out the pipe, it's actually what's actually happening in the river. Um, I'm with you, Sharon, I'm completely fed up with that. And um, I'm looking forward to working with you in the EPA to actually make South 32 and the EPA improve their performance there. Okay, um, another one on the chat line from Janine. Is there no requirement to rehabilitate the mine and any works associated with it? Great, great question, Janine. Thank you for that. Um, absolutely, yes. So take the first photo I showed you of the Gross River and that, that was the Canyon Mine. The rehabilitation has 100% focused on the terrestrial disturbance. So that was a really large area. I'm not sure the size, but perhaps a couple of hundred hectares. and they had a big rail loop, they washed the coal um, and they had all the surface sheds and vehicle tracks, et cetera. 
yes, they've addressed that, they've removed buildings, um, they've done replantings, they just did nothing with the water pollution coming out the side of the hill. And I'm not sure how much they could have done, but um, they just seem to be completely blind to it. Um, so I think there's a focus on the, on the terrestrial and to the built environment in terms of rehabilitation, but in terms of the you know, difficult water quality and ecological effects in the aquatic environment downstream, um, I'm, I'm finding we're not so good at doing that. Okay. Um, a quick one from Graham Lauscher. Um, how difficult is it to treat the mine discharge? It is really difficult, Graham. It's a huge problem. And I, I, don't, I don't dismiss how difficult it is for the miner. Uh, for, you know, to, to be honest, to do something like reverse osmosis, um, which is what they're doing at Kernel. So Kernel, they're sucking in seawater and pumping out pretty much close to pure H2O. That's what they need to do. And it uses immense amount of you know, pressure, energy, sucks in electricity um, and it creates this waste product which at the moment they're dumping in Port Kembla estuary. It's difficult, it's expensive and frankly it just makes me want to advocate for renewables more and more. There's just no easy answer to any of this but my big concern Graham is when they shut we're going to be lucky to find another borel. They'll actually go back and clean it up. I I, I'm, I'm really concerned about what's going to happen in future decades. Um, and there won't be any money and there's such expensive things to treat. I don't think they're going to do it. Okay. Look, I'll take uh, one more question from the floor if anybody's uh, got one. And then uh, we'll have to move on, I think. Any more out there? Uh, yes, Kim, Deb, Andrew. Okay, one more, Deb. Uh, why, why shouldn't the mines, particularly the water catchments, be required to uh, treat their waste? And if they can't, um, not be allowed to operate? Oh, great question, Debbie. Um, uh, thanks for everyone. They're all been great questions. Uh, I just take the example. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, um, I, I look at the, I get asked to help out with, with communities and interpret uh, you know, plans for extensions of mines. So I recent, recently looked at the Russell Vale, and I'm sure a few people here um, made submissions to Russell Vale Colliery. So Russell Vale discharges, um, I think, untreated waste into um, a, a waterway. Oh, I just, the name has just gone from my head. Um, is it Balambi? It yes. goes down to a wetland, is that correct? Um, the EPA license for that had two indicators, um, pH and I think total suspended sediment. There was no requirement for the miner to treat it and remove metals. Um, mm. Looked at the Helensburg mine that discharges its waste into a tributary of the Hacking River. That, mm. is, that is just unbelievable to me. Again, there's no metals, there's no discharge mm going into that. Um, mm. The Dixbeam mine, they can reduce, they can release gargantuan amount, amounts of arsenic, nickel, mm. copper. It, it, it's actually unbelievable to me. Disgraceful. Mm. Um, so, so and, I, and yes, and, and you know, Steve's point before, it's frustrating for the EPA, but the EPA are nobbled and they're not given the resources and the you know, political support to take this on, which I believe is in the long-term interests of, you know, mm. the, but I'm, I'm particularly thinking of the future generations that are going to have to address these problems. Yeah. So should we be, um, we should be asking this of our local members. Why Absolutely. About? Elected members, local, state and federal. Um, mm. And by the way, I heard City of Sydney have just um, uh, taken a council decision, passed a council decision, um, to stop mining under the catchments. I wish more, I wish more could mm. do that. Great. Mm. Local, state, federal, let them know. Mm. Thank you. I'll ask a local member how he thinks, what he thinks about his three-year-old son's future of living in Sydney with those sorts of problems. 
And that's exactly right. That's exactly right. What are we passing on to future generations? When I'm teaching my classes, I, I, you know, as long as a, as well as an acknowledgement of country, I acknowledge that my, my generation hasn't done very well and they've got a whole lot of work that will be unfunded. They're going to need to fix up. Yes, that's a, that's a worry for all of us. Um, look, thanks, Ian. Um, I'll be asking Sharon to um, to thank you shortly, but um, we're going to move on to general business. But our first item of general business is about the IPC uh, hearing into the dendrobium uh, mine expansion proposal um, and uh, getting people to write submissions. Uh, on that, I don't know whether you want to stay around for that um, discussion. Um, I'm, I'm, I've, I've actually got a dinner cooked um, in the other room. Okay, so yeah, that's, that's fine. Okay. But, I'll, uh, but I'm making I'll a submission it. to that, um, and I'm just looking. I can see the chat comments. Thanks, thanks, Sharon. It is Balambi Creek and Balambi, and thank you, Catherine, for correcting me. It wasn't just the City of Sydney; it's the local government association of New South Wales. Thank you. Good on your local government. Okay. Um, okay. So, Sharon, uh, I wonder if you could um, thank Ian formally on uh, off behalf. Uh, hi, Ian. How are you? And um, oh, I've good. Thanks, Sharon. <laughs> I tried to butt in so many times, but with our dog barking and our glass, <laughs> I kept muting and unmuting myself. So I'm really sorry, but it doesn't matter. Hopefully, no the rest of the participants will stay around for a while when you leave, because we just need to chat. What uh, chat about what Oatly Flora and Fauna is going to do about submissions for the dendrobium extension, which is an absolute shocker. But I would just like to thank you, and I'm going to read this thank you so I stay stay on topic. Um, so thank you so thank much, Ian, tonight. People wanted to hear you again, even though you've spoken to off before. Um, I think you're really a superb science educator, and you've impressed us all again. And I'm sure um, we won't forget um, particularly how you manage to relate science to the commonplace really effectively. And thank you very much for re reacquainting me with your bug family. I really enjoyed that <laughs> kind of story that you were able to weave into your presentation. Um, on the whole, I think you're dealing complex science and get the pitch right. You explain really coherently but never oversimplify or generalise to the point that audiences feel patronised. I think that that's a real gift you have. Your science is demonstrably robust. Robust. I know you have authored many peer-reviewed papers. It's also authentically feel collected and tested. But again, it's marvellous how you actually engage students in the community in scientific process. Fantastic. And we see a lot of um, citizen science, actually that's so um, superficial, you know, take a photo and um, send it in. And that's, that's called citizen science. I know as a community member, when I've been involved in projects that you've generated, it's been real science and you've actually valued the contribution of, of um, community members. And you've also obviously done so much for the students who are um, privileged enough to have you as a teacher. So alongside your scientific rigour, I respond to your passion for the environment and your drive to protect it. And it's so timely that you choose to investigate and fight against coal mining and drinking water catchments right now. You add so much credibility to the cause that you know, activists need. I mean, we need independent science, scientists like you to speak out. So thanks for tonight and thanks for your work more generally. And I guess I might see you at the IPC hearing into the Dendrobium um, Extension Project really soon in December. Thank, thanks very much, Sharon. Um, that's, that's really kind and generous um, and a little bit embarrassing. Um, and <laughs> no, we, we have worked, worked together a bit <laughs> over the years. Um, and for example, I really appreciated you letting me know about the scale um, and footprint of the Tamil colliery. So you alerted me that the impact from that was going all the way down Bargo River, down Bargo Gorge into the Pern. So that's now what we're working on. So you've triggered a lot of um, citizen science. So um, thank you for those extremely kind comments. No, thanks to you. Okay, thanks, Ian. It was a wonderful talk. Thanks, Entertaining Ian. and thank illuminating. You. 
and uh, somebody suggested disturbing at the same time, <laughs> uh, which is um, a bit of a paradox, but uh, a wonderful talk. I'm sure we've all enjoyed it, as Sharon has said. Okay, so uh, we'll see you around the traps. Uh, enjoy your dinner. Th thank you very much. And, and um, yes, I'll be putting in a submission on, 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 on dendrobium. Um, and I'm particularly concerned that they're using the dendrobium license to dump waste from other mines into the Port Kembla estuary. I can't believe it. Um, happy to swap notes. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for the kind comments um, and excellent questions and interest. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Thank Good you, night. Ian. Bye. Fantastic. Bye. Thank you. Okay, we'll move over to uh, general business, as I said, and uh, the first of which is uh, an update on the Independent Planning Commission's examination into the dendrobium expansion proposal. Uh, that's happening on the 2nd to the 4th of December, uh, and they're calling for submissions uh, which close um, on the 15th of December. So we've got some more time to put in those submissions, not all that long, but I'd just like to um, ask Sharon to, uh, to talk about the proposal and all the reasons that we should have uh, for objecting strongly to it. Uh, they're quite dramatic. Over to you, Sharon. Okay, so I'm sorry if I repeat anything you've just said, but what I'll do is I'll just read out the crux of the letter that Off is about to um, email out to all members because I think it explains things. It's a request that we all send in objections against the proposed dendrobium long wall coal mine extension under the Avon and Cordo Dam catchments. Um, I'm going to preempt these comments by saying that New South Wales is the only place in the developed world where the government continues to approve coal mining under drinking water catchments. So we're not just talking about legacy issues, we're talking about the fact that our government, our state government, keeps approving new projects under our drinking water catchments. So the dendrobium projects project operated by South 32 has already been responsible for very damaging impacts in the catchments of the Avon and Cordo dams. These are the water supply for Wollongong and the Greater MacArthur region of Southwest Sydney, which is exploding in population right now. They also act as a backup supply via the upper canal link to the rest of metropolitan Sydney. That was, for example, vital when the bushfires of 2020 really spoiled the Warragamba da Dam um, water quality um, by fouling the dam with debris, ash and algae. South 32 have applied for an extension to mine for another 28 years. Some of its predicted features and impacts are surface subsidence of more than two metres will, crack with, will cause cracks in bedrock as much as 400 millimetres wide and with fractures that connect from the surface, the land surface, to the mine hundreds of metres below. In the past, um, catastrophic damage has occurred when uh, subsidence at the surface is one metre. And in this instance, that figure is set to double in terms of the subsidence at the surface. It'll be two metres. That's the prediction. This project will undermine 25 upland swamps, an uncounted number of small streams, come to within 300 metres of the edges of the Avon and Cordo dams, and to within, within 1,000 um, metres of the dam walls, which, new, which water New South Wales who own the dams claims is far too close. They say the safe standard is something in excess of 1,500 metres. Water New South Wales have objected saying the predicted loss of 5.2 megalitres per day is unacceptable. On the other hand, the Department of Planning, Infrastructure and the Environment, DPIE, recommends an approval based on the economic value of the metallurgical coal its relationship with domestic steel production, export royalties, and its contribution to the regional economy of Wollongong. The DPI does not consider alternatives, and some of those more immediately feasible are limiting mine widths to lessen subsidence, continuing to mine the bull ice seam coal nearby, but outside the drinking water catchment, so eliminating the need to mine area five of the dendrobium area, and changing the blue scope blast furnace coal blend 
so that the Wongawili coal from area six of the dendrobium area is not required. That would prevent, that would actually um, wipe out a whole area, a whole set of long walls within the catchment if they could just work out a different blend of coal to produce steel. And in fact, when you think about it, around the world, there are so many other uh, steel mills that don't rely, you know, on a unique blend of bull eye seam and wongawili seam. So mm -hmm. what's so special about that? The DPI economic case for the project is based on a consultant's report that says of its own methodology, it rang key, stakeho key stakeholders on the 25th of the 3rd, but could not do face-to-face -face meetings because of the COVID-19 crisis. And further, some of the affected companies have only been prepared to provide limited data. So basically in conclusion, if you care about the long-term security of our water supplies and value the water of two dams, so pure that it requires little treatment and therefore can be delivered to us at less cost and largely as a gift from nature, so long as we protect it, please make an objection. And please share um, this information with your friends because if you make an objection and can get a friend to make an objection, that's fantastically powerful. So the letter that you'll receive will give you the date of the public hearing, which is the 2nd, 3rd and 4th of December. I know some off members have registered to speak and um, you can watch that live stream from the IPC web website if you're a tragic like I am, because I'll be watching it. It doesn't matter if you aren't able to speak and haven't registered. Uh, the letter also gives you a submission guide from Protect Our Water Alliance, which is really excellent. Um, and some other advice so that you can write your own unique objection. And it is important that everybody puts something in their own words and it doesn't matter how short it is. And that must be in by um, the deadline of the 15th of the 12th. But I'd ask you to get onto it really, really soon because Christmas is coming and we all need a bit of a holiday. Okay, thanks Sharon. Um, yes, uh, I registered this afternoon to speak. Thank you. Uh, I was presumptuous in saying I'd speak on behalf of OFF. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I, in effect, reserved a position for somebody from OFF to speak, at least, uh, even if it's not me. Um, we're also uh, going to put together our own sub a submission from OFF uh, formally. Uh, I'd be seeking the committee's input to that. Um, so, uh, Yes, oh, and just mentioned that um, Sharon mentioned Protect Our Water Alliance. Well, Oatley Floor and Fauna is a member of the Protect Our Water Alliance. We joined two or three years ago, Graham, last year. Yep. And um, uh, we've been active in um, objecting to a lot of these um, and commenting on a lot of these mining proposals in our water catchments, uh, including the Warrenora. Uh, so we want to uh, support that uh, organisation in um, objecting to this one as well. Uh, so uh, I'll get that, um, that email out tomorrow with all this information in it. And uh, there's, a, there's a wealth of information in there from uh, power. So, uh, but you don't have to use it all. Uh, as Sharon said, submissions can be quite short, but if they are unique, and give um, comment on your personal experiences, uh, then uh, that will um, help a lot. Uh, IPC apparently put a lot of weight in unique submissions. So uh, that's with that. Is there any other any other comments that need to be made on that one? No. Nope.